Number one, it takes more than hormones to fix our hormones. It is the lifestyle changes that we make that will affect our hormones. I want to talk to you about weight gain. Mm. Now, obviously you've been a practitioner for many, many years. You've helped a lot of people. Why is it that it seems to get more difficult to stay in a healthy weight range as we get older? Well, and especially in today's time, but I'll tell you that just from my own personal experience, I've been well over 240 pounds. And so had, you know, just a terrible metabolism, both sides of my family. Um, predisposed to diabetes. Actually, both parents passed away due to complications of diabetes. And so I know this area really well. And of course, like you look at how your parents age or health conditions they have, and you say to yourself, that is never going to be me, right? I'm going to find a way. And I went into medicine to really understand how to prevent disease. But there I was, <laughs> practicing physician, you know, and and kept gaining weight gaining weight, not sleeping, doing OB, eating, you know, maybe one meal a day late at night when I was done work and drinking coffee all through the day. I mean, it was, you know, very destructive to my metabolism. And then I worked really hard to understand what was going on and to lose that weight, right? To lose that weight. And then midlife, I started gaining like my patients would say, they'd come and say, Dr. Ann, I've gained five, 10, 20 pounds without doing anything different, mm -hmm. right? And you hear that a lot. And you know, as a young physician, I was like, sure, sure you're not doing anything different. Right. <laughs> like, let me see what's in your purse. You know, are you driving through on your way home for, you know, driving through for your meals or what's going on? When it happened to me, it was very humbling because, you know, certainly I, I, I took that to heart and I always checked thyroid and checked hormones and checked you know, their food diary and things like that. But I didn't understand the metabolic changes that are happening as we age. And you cannot do anything different and start gaining weight because on the hormonal level, the, you know, anabolic hormones are decreasing and your catabolic hormones are increasing. So cortisol is increasing, which naturally raises your blood sugar. Insulin's increasing. And those are the two of the big ones. And there are 13 weight control hormones that we really know of. And so you put all that together and it's the perfect storm, especially for women. Oh, man. Okay. So how do we get a handle on this, you know, with potentially, again, like this is and you said it before you even got got going there that it's especially today especially emphasis today. on that why is it even more so today because even if we look at past generations the weight gain issue hasn't been remotely as big as it is today yeah yeah as extreme and it is because of hormone disruptors and obesogens in our food chain in our environment in our skin care I mean, those are things that are disrupting. A study done, oh gosh, it was early 2000s, looked at umbilical cord blood and found, I think it was 267 chemicals, 192 which were known carcinogens, in umbilical cord blood. And as an obstetrician, I always tell moms, your baby's in the safest place in the world when the baby's in your womb. But yet already in the womb is being exposed to harmful chemicals. And that can last for generations. That, you know, can take three, four, five, six, seven generations to eliminate from, but we're getting constant exposure. So those obesogens are part of the problem for sure. There's even this category of these quote forever chemicals. Yes. Right? Ugh, that it's that. in like all kinds of packaging and stuff that our food is coming in. And like you just said, it can be difficult to avoid. Even in the womb now, we're getting infiltrated mm -hmm. by this. But the cool thing is by the way, the womb and you know the placenta but that whole thing is very protective very you just said it like safest place to be at the same time there's only so much that the human body can take and we're creating a really toxic environment yeah so that awareness though can empower us to do things like detoxing cleansing eliminating our future exposures our current and future exposures we can't do anything with what's done but what can we do now to cleanse from those chemicals as much as possible some we don't know how to get rid of yet, but we can eliminate future exposures as much as possible. So I think that's 
encouraging. And then plus, as our hormones shifting, understand what we have to do with what we have to prioritize as a lifestyle in order to Im- enhance our physiology mm. so that we can have, and I like to say the time after for menopause for women, but and andropause for men, but the second spring of our lives. So how we how we enter into the second spring of our lives, which can be more beautiful, more powerful, more passionate than, you know, I say the he- the heady time of all our reproductive years. So yeah, that's inspiring to hear <laughs> because of course there's so much fear around that transition Mm -hmm. and you know it's just all downhill from here Mm -hmm. and to hear that we can access more joy more happiness potentially better health you know but it really starts with what's going on with our hormones so you mentioned that we have this interesting change happening where more anabolic regenerative hormones are kind of decreasing as time goes on Uh, one of the ones that jumps out to me it's kind of the youth hormone is hgh Mm -hmm. for example and one of the buffers we could have there is of course exercise but then again there's things with our lifestyle as well a big one is sleep sleep exactly so important and like we have to prioritize sleep sound deep sleep i'm not sure about the duration of sleep i think there's an individualization there and it depends on the quality of sleep and and the individual but i think that sleep and exercise i'm staying with my friend here in california lavinia and she is a a, just such an advocate for exercise she goes just start each day with exercise and you're going to have a better day and it's true because i know that improves our mood and that fitness and whatever it is for you keeping fit keeping flexible that's rejuvenating Mm. yeah yeah If you could, can you share a little bit, you just mentioned with sleep, quality versus quantity in a sense. What are some of the things that, and you, again, you know this experientially, when making that transition, if even around times of menopause, premenopause, perimenopause, sleep issues can Mm -hmm. obviously be a big deal, hot flashes and things and the like. What are some of the things that people can do to improve their sleep quality. Yeah, definitely. A good night's sleep always starts with a good morning routine. So like starting your day off with exercise, with, you know, ideally without caffeine being the first thing you do and really starting your adrenals off well supported in the day. So I use an adaptogenic blend. It's my blend, Mighty Maca. So I'll drink that in the morning and lots of hydration in the morning. And so you set your day up for support and then have your coffee and break fast, right? And then for your evening ritual, I think it's really important to establish a good evening ritual like we do for babies. And I'm a grandma now, so it's very fresh because my granddaughter lives with me and she's one. And so getting her into her sleep routine, it's really specific. What are the cues that are going to start winding you down and get you to sleep? Maybe it's a a hot shower followed by a cold plunge or maybe it's your you know your after your evening meal your reading and meditation time but then there's things so you're you're setting yourself up for a good night's sleep and winding down naturally now sometimes we need to supplement in perimenopause and menopause i often use um, again adaptogens like maca and i also use progesterone so bioidentical progesterone topically in a cream to help can help both men and women to get that better night's sleep oral progesterone as well works even better for for sleep especially in menopause and beyond so you can do those things too and other supplements optimizing like as far as setting your sleep cycle getting sunset so your eyes are triggered red light blocking out blue light I mean those setting your room to 65 degrees and making it pitch black so those are things that can definitely help with getting a good night's sleep. That 3 a.m. waking, though, because of that cortisol surge, is that's why it's so important to really stay steady on your diet. Again, for me, it's like low-carb type of living or, you know, flex, flexing in some carbs periodically. But that's the keto green lifestyle so that your blood sugar stays really stable. So you're not going to get this crazy spike in the middle of the night. And with keep maintaining healthy blood sugar levels, your cortisol will be better managed. But still in that perimenopause, you get that 3 a.m. spike. And so supporting your adrenals before bed is, again, part of reducing that. And and you can use supplements, too, for that. 
you mentioned starting the day off with instead of running right for something that's kind of a nervous system stimulant yeah and it's also stimulant for our endocrine system as well but you mentioned maca mm -hmm. so can you talk about what, first of all what is maca and why would this be something that we want to to take yeah so i actually learned about maca from my own personal journey so when I was 39, I was in early menopause and infertile, and I was told I would never be able to have another baby. And so I took a sabbatical from my practice and went to Peru, because I had a nurse from Peru, and I loved her very much and her family. So we actually took a trip around the world, but we started in Peru. And everywhere they went, they said, you're infertile, drink maca. If you're tired, drink maca. If you're... Then they would elbow my husband at the time and say, it's the Peruvian Viagra. So for sure, you know we're drinking some maca, right? I'm like, okay, but let me understand the science behind it. And um, maca stems, I mean, its origin is in Peru. It's in the high Andes of Peru, and it's where the ancient Incan warriors were reported to have drink to drink maca or to eat maca before they went to battle because it gave them stamina and energy and this virility, right? And so for, you know, for centuries, it's part of the medicinal foods of, of Peru and helps with altitude sickness. And, and so as I dug into it, first, I couldn't stand the taste of maca. So I started adding it well, with other superfoods. I'm like, if this is a superfood, what other ones are native to Peru or this area in South America? And so I started mixing it with other superfoods. So number one, it would taste better. And I was like, well, if the combination, you know, see if the combinations would work even better. But I dug into the science behind maca. And so behind the folklore, there's a tremendous amount of science. And the structure of maca is really interesting. So, you know, the native Peruvian maca, not Chinese maca, has very specific proteins, and they're called macaines. So very unique proteins to maca. And it's also rich in arginine which arginine, as you know, will increase nitric oxide, which increases blood flow, which is how Viagra works. So here with some science to prove it, it's also high in histidine, which helps with orgasm. And, um, and so I thought it was just fascinating as I got into it, but it's also been studied as adaptogenic and research on sex, like it can help all stages of sexual dysfunction. So from desire to um, orgasm to, you know, just the innate um, primary and secondary response, sexual response. So that was all beautiful to hear that in both men and women and, um, and hawk lashes. And so it just has this adaptogenic, like uh, nature, similar to resveratrol, turmeric, quercetin, all of those superfoods, which have adaptogenic natures as well oh, so, so i awesome. love it yeah. yeah oh my gosh and here's the thing again it's been utilized for thousands of years mm -hmm. and you just mentioned the adaptogenic aspect of this what is that it means we're it helps us to adapt to stress essentially yes. you know and so since we're on the subject of sex as we age again that becomes like viagra is one of the most profitable drugs out here it's been like that for quite some time it started off in the domain of like cardiovascular <laughs> benefit but it's just like accidentally you know you're pitching the tent over here when you're just trying to you know be able to go for a walk and you know we <laughs> <laughs> what a walk that is by the way you know but you know to to have this kind of thing that's been normalized in our culture where dysfunction is the norm and if you tie that also to the cardiovascular degradation epidemic taking place, it's just like it's no wonder that this is an issue later on in life. So let's talk about this process, this experience for a lot of women, for example, of going through menopause and having sexual dysfunction and or reduction in sexual desire and pleasure and things like that. What can women do to help to kind of restore and support their bodies to number one, be more attracted to having sex mm -hmm. and also enjoying it more. 
Yeah, there's so much to that question. And I think as I go back, I mean, I've been in medicine a long time. I mean, started in the 80s and the 90s, studying women's health and sexual health and um, as a practicing OBGYN and recognizing like, what, what do we have for women in sexual health? We have nothing, like we had nothing. And I remember in 1999, drawing labs for a patient who had come to me. And this is a really, I'm gonna share this story. So a 63 year old woman, who was silver haired, five feet 10, 155 pounds, lean, and she came in to my office and in Southeast Georgia, she said, Dr. Anna, I knew you were coming. I said, I had a breast cancer diagnosis or ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast diagnosed at Emory where you trained, I've been waiting to see you. And I'm a woman of the 60s, my vagina's dry, it hurts to have sex, I have no desire, and I'd rather die th than live this way, help me. And I was like, oh, Oh, I know, right? Like, okay, mm. here I am, a young OBGYN thinking, well, let me look in my doctor's bag. Okay, I'm trained at one of the best places in the in the world, and my doctor's bag was empty for her. With ductal carcinoma in situ, it's not breast cancer, but yet they treat it as if it is. No estrogen for you. Sorry, you're, you know, like we can't give you anything. That was her, um, you know, that was the, the uh, advice she had given been given several times from several specialists. And so she said, you know, what about androgen therapy? And I studied it and I looked at the research because I was a researcher for the US Navy actually before I went to med school. So I dug into all the research and androgens, DHEA, testosterone appeared safe. And she said, I am willing to consent with whatever you need to consent to, to do this. And so I started her on a, um, a testosterone and I started on DHEA and I optimized and but when I did her lab Sean this was so interesting 1999 I drew her labs testosterone estrogen you know sex hormone binding globulin I was digging in to see what was going on and then how can I safely manage her not to mention her you know her hemoglobin a1c and her inflammatory markers but her testosterone came back zero and it was read as normal by the lab. Because at that what? point, Wait, zero what? for, right. Zero was normal at that time for a woman because the testosterone assays we were doing in the 90s, early 2000s were, to, were designed for men and weren't sensitive enough to pick up lower levels of testosterone in women. Isn't that crazy? That's so, and it was so that, well, near, zero is normal for this a 63 year old ago. woman not that long ago and it took a long time for us to see some change and improvement in that and at that time too we were just hand calculating free testosterone levels so so <laughs> we've come a long way but and i will tell you that woman I, actually i've followed her for 20 years and at 83 she was she was doing well she had written and published a book she'd been skiing in in colorado and you know was just doing amazing, still lobbying on Capitol Hill. I mean, she was a researcher too. So, you know, it was really good to see that. And her bone strength maintained. It didn't decline as you would expect to see someone very postmenopausal have osteoporosis or osteopenia, and she hadn't. And so that was that was really encouraging. But at the time, we just didn't understand. And we still are, It's we're at our infancy. But because of her, that really put me on this path to help women with sexual health. And what can we do? What can we do naturally? How can I support them? How can we also recognize that we want to do everything that's safe so they're not at increased risk of breast cancer, but I want to help my breast cancer patients become resilient to any, you know, resilient and also have bodies that are inhospitable to cancer or recurrent cancer. So that's the goal with hormone balancing. And so when it comes to sexual health, we want to look at how do we increase desire? How do we increase function? And that took me down a long path to understand there are really three areas that interfere with our ability to our sexual, our sexual drive, let's say, and those are issues of desire, issues of discomfort, because if you hurt every time you do something, why would you want to, right? So from vaginal dryness or, or perineal pain or pelvic pain. And the third is disconnect. So if you have stress and you have relationship issues, you have trauma, you have PTSD, there's often disconnect. 
And so that's where there's war between our cortisol and our hormone oxytocin, the hormone of connection. But yet sex is a remedy for that. So you've gotta, you've gotta circumvent that. In How? So ways. Right, House okay. Way. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, so there's a few things. If there's discomfort, if there's pain, dryness issues, you've got to address the discomfort. So for women specifically, that's my area of specialty, it's addressing vaginal dryness issues. And so I use bioidentical hormones. I created a product called Jolva, which is a cosmetic cream for the vulva that restores stores natural moisture. So that increases your natural lubrication, helps the pH of the vagina too. So it's healthier and it's, it's natural secretions are better. So there's more pleasure and less discomfort during intercourse. So that's number one. Also, if there's other areas of discomfort, if it's pelvic muscle spasms or anything, that needs to be addressed. Because again, I always tell guys, well, if you were playing baseball and every time you went up to bat and got hit by the ball, would you want to keep playing baseball? Mm. So probably not. Mm. Yeah. That analogy. I'm a very visual person. So as you were, now what about... <laughs> this oxytocin gap so the oxytocin gap so recognizing that also because of my own personal story post-traumatically disconnecting from my my marriage burning out from my profession i was like wait i i love my husband i love my work how am i so i don't feel love for it anymore and that's when I understood the, the consequence of cortisol. So the cortisol oxytocin disconnect. So when cortisol goes up, the hormone of connection oxytocin goes down because when you're in that fight flight mode or, you know, you have fear, it's not like, you know, you're going to go up to an enemy and hug them, right? It's that designed for you just to be in that primal instinct. So cortisol's up, oxytocin is low. But when cortisol and when oxytocin's up, cortisol's low. When you're feeling loved, when you're feeling connected, when you're laughing, you have less stress, less stress, less cortisol. So, um, so that's powerful. But when cortisol's up, right? Oxytocin's low. When cortisol's up for a long time, then the paraventricular nucleus in the brain, the area um, governing the release often of the adrenal hormones and and cortisol is suppressed. So cortisol gets suppressed. So now you're at this state where cortisol is low and oxytocin is low. If someone did a salivary test and you saw this low cortisol, likely they're feeling disconnected and burnt out, right? Mm. It's very hard to measure oxytocin in the blood, but this, when you're at this stage, it feels like when you go into the grocery store and you see someone you grew up with and you're like, I don't see them. I don't know who they are. I'm pretending they don't see me. Or you don't go out to dinner, you don't do the things that you used to love doing, painting or playing or whatever it may be. And you feel like, God, I know, you know, I love my kids, I don't feel love for them. Or I used to love, I had a urologist tell me, I used to love going into the, my office and seeing my patients until the paperwork took over. Now I don't even want to go in any longer. That disconnect, that burnout from the things you love to do, and that's what that feels like. So the anecdote to that is to focus on oxytocin, which is free for the most part. Certainly we can supplement and prescribe oxytocin if needed, but by doing things that increase oxytocin. So watching a funny movie, like My Big Fat Greek Wedding, it's one of my favorites for sure. So what I about think, Talladega Nights? We talked about uh, yeah, that before we got I don't started. Know, that's cringeworthy. You're, you're not a fan, not a fan. but <laughs> it is a classic, as you were. Okay, so beyond funny movies, but think people that make you laugh, having really, you know, conversations like we're having, where you can feel at ease and be yourself and your authentic self and have fun. So I always say, you know, the, the theory of the red wine theory is that, uh, you know, a glass of red wine increases your longevity because of resveratrol. I'm like, is it the glass of red wine? Or is it the, you know, family sitting at the table with friends mm. and you're drinking together, laughing together, you're in safe community. That more likely is the is bringing up oxytocin, the hormone of longevity. It's even a lot more than resveratrol. I love resveratrol, but yeah. that is oxytocin is doing more. And of course, affection, kissing, hugging, um, you know, if, you know, 
orgasm, certainly sexual health and pleasure, head massages, you know, kids, mm. people love head massage, you love to go to your hairdresser for a head massage, and that increases oxytocin, swinging on a playground, a swing set, mm. that increases oxytocin, you can't not swing and laugh, you know, it's like, that increases oxytocin. So playing with a pet and having a pet increases longevity. So that and a healthy marriage increases longevity. And so having safe, close connection community increases oxytocin good friendships you know community groups and that's very common through all the blue zone is that thread of community we have access to all this stuff all like, free. and it's free mm -hmm. that's so wonderful mm -hmm. you know but we're also today um the former u.s surgeon general which i think he's back in the office but his team had reached out to me a couple years ago about his book and it was centered around this loneliness epidemic and a lot of the data and it was just you know I'll, i go and cross-reference stuff and look through and it's just like this is a serious problem you know and it was looking at the way that he positioned it which you know it's it's debatable but it's definitely a part of the equation that it's our biggest health epidemic is loneliness and so when we're not engaging in these things and especially engaging with each other, mm -hmm. we, but also I want to talk about this too, because you could be with people and still feel lonely, yes. right? So this is, it's one of those things where we're kind of, it's like a vicious circle mm -hmm. in a sense where we are lacking this thing that we can get by doing the thing, but without the thing, it makes us not want to do the thing. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, yeah, absolutely. play that back, play that back. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> no, like that sense that I know I need to feel, I need to have good community to get more connection, but I don't feel it, right? I'm feeling, I still feel alone in a room full of people. And that I go back to the physiology, that cortisol, oxytocin disconnect. So you've got to manage that stress cortisol response because you can feel like, like for me, it was like, oh, I've got this handled, right? But I had PTSD under the surface. So that was constantly that revving engine. So for many times when you're isolated, despite knowing that you have people that care about you, it's that trauma either from adverse childhood experiences, post traumatic, post traumatic stress, and there's a wiring to that. So you have to break that connection and the best meditation, EMDR, doing brain tap, doing things to break those nervous connections that gamma nerve root signaling that, you know, trained, um, say the ruts in the road, basically. And I'm sure Daniel Amen talks about that too, those automatic negative thoughts that that under the surface is continuing that cortisol feed, that revving engine. And you can only take it for so long. But the anecdote, oxytocin, in addition to healing that, I mean, has so many health benefits, but things you do regularly to increase oxytocin. So pet therapy for veterans in nursing homes. So having a pet that starts to decrease, cort you know, regulate cortisol, but increase oxytocin. So you start to have this shift, this empowerment, and then you've got to reset the circadian rhythm. So that's part of the equation to get well. So. Wow. So in essence, there's this kind of inverse relationship with oxytocin and cortisol. Mm -hmm. And if both of them are low, then we are in kind of that state that you're describing. That isolation, feeling of isolation. And it's just, and this is what I love about your work too, is just taking people just step by step, one step at a time, mm -hmm. add a little thing in, and also removing things that are blockages for this process. Now, when you mentioned with orgasm, having oxytocin be present, there's like a cocktail of other chemistry that takes place, right? And I just got to thinking how a lot of that also relates to overall reproductive health. So with prolactin, for example, that has to do with milk production mm -hmm. as well. And yeah. again, it was just like, we're producing this stuff, men and women actually, in the context of getting together and doing freaky stuff. <laughs> Okay, freaky stuff. There's visuals there. Okay. <laughs> Can tell me more about that. <laughs> <laughs> and also so. another thing that you mentioned earlier with these stress hormones as well, there are also good stressors. So like we'll release norepinephrine, for example, in the context of orgasm. So it's just like cocktail of things that have all of these other benefits 
that don't just do one thing. Right. You know, and so. And it's so powerful because you think about you think about that. So just with with sex in general, that connection, that intimacy and how oxytocin affects the male and female differently. That's a piece of it. And then the, the many ways that our body is designed to make oxytocin. So there are oxytocin receptors all over our body. When you said with childbirth, you know, and as an obstetrician, we gave Pitocin in labor to stimulate stronger, faster, harder contractions. But that oxytocin is that hormone of attachment. So that is so powerful, that hormone of attachment, so that when we deliver this baby, we are now bonded to this baby. And they may look kind of, you know, you know, wrinkly and you know, whatever, hairy and all this stuff, but they're the most beautiful child you've ever seen in that moment. And you are bonded to that child for life, for sure. So there's that oxytocin connection piece that is designed for, you know, that evolution, evolutionary reasons to, to protect that child and, and to be able to provide for that child to have all the desire to. When we take that childbirth experience away, we lose that natural oxytocin surge that is is um, part of that experience. And certainly sometimes we have to when we do a scheduled cesarean section. But it's important to understand that, you know, that's where, again, breastfeeding will be really important because every time we breastfeed, we're increasing oxytocin and that hormone of connection, that bonding. And that's so beneficial for the woman and the baby. And also we're increasing the prolactin. So you have that milk letdown. And so that's very therapeutic as well. So that connection of hormones by design and then throughout life, the importance of sex to maintain the, you know, couple relationship that that keeps us connected when we have sex in relationship. When we take it out of a marriage, we become roommates and it's one of the most, the sexless marriage is a very common reason for divorce. But how did it get there? What was the reasons of loss of desire or discomfort or disconnect? Those are the three primary reasons we end up in a sexless marriage. All right, let's go back to loss of desire. Let's dig a little bit deeper on this one. How can we address that? So it's not uncommon to lose like primary desire, like, you know, different for men and women. But for women specific, like for men, it's very visual. I think I want to have sex. I'm ready to have sex. For women, it's more of a secondary desire. And that means that once, and this I heard it from patients, that they started asking questions. And, you know, when my patients have no no libido or, you know, I just don't want to have sex with my husband, I, I never initiate it, but I'm good once we get started. Then I'm into it once we get started. And, and I heard that over and over again and then read the Bassan model of secondary sec sexual desire. So what does that mean? It means, okay, start caressing our hormones, oxytocin, dopamine start increasing. Now I'm turned on and then I'm into it, right? But how do we get more of that primary desire? So there's two things. And I have a program, it's called Sexual CPR because there's so much to this area. And it's, you know, the first class is help doctor, my sex drive has no pulse, right? dead. But, but the whole thing is, I mean, it's so much to this, but the first two secrets that men and women need to know about each other, so that they want to have sex more, is um, a man needs to know that oxytocin on a woman increases her desire for connection and intimacy. So I had a couple come into my medical practice and they were in their late 30s 37 and they'd been married about 10 years or so and and he said you know she has great orgasm she climaxes and but she never wants to initiate sex and she'd been my patient for a while so i knew like her gyn history and everything and and she said yeah no i mean sex is great but i i just don't want to initiate it so i looked at him i said what's the first thing you do after sex and he goes after sex what's the first thing i do can answer that in your head or out loud if you want, Sean. But he said, <laughs> I roll over and go to sleep. Mm. And I said, of course, like oxytocin makes you sleepy, relaxed, and you roll over and go to sleep. You're done. Right. And, and for women, for the most part, it's that time where oxytocin's high and that's that connection. 
that intimacy. That's the time to give her two minutes, you know, like same amount of time it takes to brush your teeth or tie your shoes or, or whatever. Or have that orgasm for some people. Right, right. <laughs> two minutes, or have another one. Two <laughs> minutes, take that time to positive reinforcement, verbal, caressing, talking, you know, encouraging words, loving, bonding moment, just for, just for a couple minutes. And let's see what happens. And they came back in, I think it was six weeks or eight weeks later. And she's like, she's initiating sex over half the time. She goes, it is so, like, I look forward to it because I know I have that time. Like, I get that positive reinforcement now. Mm. And so that connection was really, like, that's the cherry on top for us. Not the climax, not the orgasm. It's that feeling, that intimacy and connection for most of us in the relationship. That piece, if that piece is missing that often it's secondary desire and there's no longer that primary desire. And then the second secret, so that's always the secret that I want men to know about women to get them wanting to have more sex. And the secret that I want women to know about men, and this is a question I asked many men, I interviewed some of the most chauvinistic men on the planet, I think, and I asked them, well, what is your turn on with sex like when you have sex with your wife or your partner what turns you on the most what you know what's your ultimate like what makes you what's your ultimate goal and every one of them said her turn on her pleasure was his pleasure her turn on was his turn on when she loved it he loved it and so that was it and for women to realize that Look, in order for you to feel that pleasure, to be turned on, you've got to express what feels good to you. You can't just power through or check this box on your list. That's your time for pleasure. That's your time to bask in the love, the connection, the physical pleasure and intimacy that your body is designed for and express what's turning you on because that's honestly, he's not, you know what I mean, for the most part, <laughs> he's just not there to do whatever, get his job done and, and be done with it. Your turn on is his turn on. That's his biggest turn on. And so as women realize that, I mean, that was, that's powerful realization. This is so good. So good. And it just, again, it makes so much sense, you know, with the positive reinforcement, for example. And uh, also, I think there's a lot of truth in that, you know, even with the most chauvinistic fellas out there, um, you know, thinking about that. So, now, since we're talking about this cascade of chemicals that we release during orgasm, I want to reference a classic treatise <laughs> called Sleep Smarter. And this is my first book. And actually, as of this recording, um, it is the anniversary, actually, of the release of uh, Sleep Smarter. And it really helped to shift cultures back in 2015. This was the major published version of it. It's translated in, like, I think 22 different wow. languages now. So it's pretty profound. But in it, there's a chapter called The Big O and how it impacts our sleep. And on page 69. It, it, it just so happened. <laughs> I didn't do that on purpose. A reader had let me know. And that's true story. Damn it. And so um, I talk about oxytocin a little bit, but you, you obviously flesh it out so much and it's so wonderful. But in particular with prolactin, prolactin is... Yes, of course, linked to sexual satisfaction, but also deeply re related to sleep. And animals injected with prolactin become tired immediately. Mm. This is, of all the different chemical cascade, the one that tends to make you tired. If you think about that phenomenon, which you just mentioned, rolling over and going to sleep, prolactin is that boy. Now, in particular, now this was so fascinating to me. Researchers discovered that this whole, even when we talk about going another round, it's because prolactin is up. When prolactin can come back down, that's when you can go back up in mm -hmm. a sense. And it's also important to note that men produce four times more prolactin when having an orgasm through intercourse compared to masturbation, which is really interesting as well. So this might be that phenomenon where afterwards with your sexual partner, you roll over and go to sleep versus mm -hmm. when you do it by yourself, you go get a bowl of cereal. <laughs> uh, for women, prolactin surges are deeply connected to the quality of orgasm and also subsequent sexual satisfaction. And this was actually cited in the Journal of Sexual Medicine. So again, we've, we've got this amazing, intelligent pharmacy within our bodies. Yes. And with sex, 
where we kind of get tunnel vision with this thing, this chemistry affects so many other areas of our lives. And I love that you, because the title of one of your books is The Hormone Fix and like addressing these things because what I'm really gathering is that so much of our experience is dependent upon our hormone function. And a lot of times, even when we say like, somebody's coming in to see you, my, my hormones are out of whack. We don't even know what that means. Mm -hmm. So if we could, let's talk a little bit about our hormones themselves. Like what are they, what does this mean when we say my hormones are out of whack? What am I actually saying? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's that feeling that you're not at home in your own body. When you start saying something like my hormones are out of whack, you're just like, I'm, I'm not at home in my own body. Something is off. It's like, you know, I need I need to go in for a tune up. And it often is true. And in my book, The Hormone Fix, the biggest thing that I emphasize is, is that number one, it takes more than hormones to fix our hormones. It is the lifestyle changes that we make that will affect our hormones. And when we're typically, we have hundreds of hormones in our body. And as in, in medicine, as a gynecologist and obstetrician, I was trained to focus on the reproductive hormones, right? So progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, maybe a little bit on DHEA as an adrenal hormone, but was really focused on those hormones. But the master hormones to our reproductive, the more important hormones than our reproductive hormones are insulin and cortisol. And the most important hormone is oxytocin. So again, everything we can do to empower oxytocin is going to help all the other hormones. But insulin, becoming insulin sensitive, that's going to manage your progesterone levels better. Your testosterone will be better behaved when you're insulin, when you're more insulin sensitive. And cortisol, when we're producing a lot of cortisol or we're out of whack with our cortisol, it's dysfunctional, then our our progesterone levels are lower, our reproductive hormones are lower, estrogen and testosterone. So when we can get insulin and cortisol in balance, we're addressing these other hormones and that's diet and lifestyle. That's through the practices that everything we can do to increase, you know, uh, um, a balanced circadian rhythm, balanced cortisol levels to disconnect from the chronic revving engine, PTSD, chronic everyday stress cortisol pattern, to disconnect from that with meditation, lifestyle changes, heart math, um, EMDR, those strategies that we can use, gratitude journaling, prayer, and again, everything that we can do to increase oxytocin and with insulin sensitizing it's part of the keto green plan the keto green way that i write about with intermittent fasting no more snacking cutting out carbs but having good you know healthy healthy quantities of protein healthy quantities of fat our hormones are derived from fat so healthy quantities of fat and good low carbohydrate you know mineral rich greens and fermented foods. So those are part of the combination that work to enhance our physiology. So our physiology is affecting our behavior. And when our hormones are out of whack, we feel moody, you know, mood swings, depression, anxiety, irritation, anger, all of these symptoms. And clients will tell me, they say, you know, I'm I yelled at my kids and I, had, I would never have reacted that way. I was out of sort. I hate myself for it. So now there's, right. you know, now you've got this all this negative cycle Guilt coming and back and physiology is affecting your behavior. And the same is true when we are supplementing with hormones, those hormones we're supplementing with are going to affect their physiology, which is also going to affect their behavior. So my criticism of many of the testosterone clinics is that they give so much testosterone, they now have dopamine seeking behaviors, novelty seeking behaviors may have anger issues, or issues with affairs and thinking ways that they typically wouldn't think because now we've revved up their testosterone. So it goes both ways. Yeah. And I love it that you, you, you start us off with what are the things we could do in our lifestyle yeah. to support all of this stuff. Yeah. And you know, with these hormones, we're talking about essentially these chemical messengers, right? Yes. Sending these metabolic DMs to get your body all on the same page. And this yeah. is why that whole phenomenon of feeling out of whack, like that communication is, is off and it could throw off everything. Just even one hormone, I would imagine, being wonky is going to screw up the entire system. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's insulin or cortisol. 
Yes, and that is exactly, I want to talk to you about this because this even leads back into our sexual health if we're talking about insulin. It's truly a master hormone in many ways because if insulin's high due to high levels of blood glucose chronically, this can inspire aromatization. You know, so like our testosterone that we're producing in particular with males and that process essentially getting stolen and getting it converted into more estrogen yep. because of chronically high insulin levels. Yep. And then moves, male and, boobs. And and moves. and moves. You know, moves are out here on the streets. They mm -hmm. have in, instead of the bra, they have the bro. Oh, really? No, nah, that was Kramer <laughs> from Seinfeld. Oh, right, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not Shout out to that. I got to do more people watching here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when we think about this and also with women, this might be leaning more towards this epidemic of PCOS as yes. well with, can you talk a little about that with, um, because obviously again, it's a big issue. Yes, definitely. With and, and it's certain genes, genetic profiles, and I have that genetic profile. Both my, both my parents had diabetes and heart disease. It's in my genetics. When we do our, you know, DNA panel or genetic panel, can see that you know I've got the genetics for PCOS. And and this is what I tell my, especially my young patients or any woman that comes in with PCOS, whether they're dealing with you know, puberty, pubertal issues, all of a sudden gaining weight and acne, that's a PCOS genotype. And or if they're having trouble with infertility, irregular cycles, and you know, I diagnose insulin resistance or PCOS with or without insulin resistance. The big thing I want them to know, I want every woman to know is that you have, you don't have fat, obese, infertile genes, you have warrior princess genes, you have Amazonian genes, you have leadership genes, you're going to build muscle faster than anyone, you are going to be able to fast longer than anyone, you have these survival leadership genes. So that's the genetics you're designed to that's the positive. So let's empower the environment to enhance and honor these amazing survivor leadership warrior genetics that you have or Pocahontas genes depend, you know, like whatever they may be. So I want I want women to understand that embrace that. Now the flip side is we're going to make more uric acid. So we know from uh, Dr. Perlmutter's book drop acid, we know that uric acid is um, evolutionary protective to be in a fasting state for long periods of time. So those if we have that propensity, and we're trying to do carnivore, we're eating a lot of red meat solely, and we're not balancing out the alkalinizers, not giving us time to intermittent fast and support our physiology, then we're going to be producing more uric acid. And that's going to make us start gaining weight despite what we're eating. And also you may or may not experience uh, symptoms of gout. So it's pretty fascinating stuff, right? But those are like, that's with that PCOS genetics. So when we work with the keto green way is perfect for women with PCOS. I mean, again, that's part of my genetic story. And, um, and that's why this works so well for me. And it works so well for, you know, for so many women, but especially through menopause. Mm. And the reason that um, it's really powerful physiologic shift, and I don't know if we covered this in our last interview that we had together. But the fact that our brain, the gluconeogenesis in the brain is estrogen dependent. And so as we're going through perimenopause and menopause, specifically ages 35 to 55, that's when our hormone progesterone levels are declining. And that's a precursor to estrogen and testosterone. But so what happens, the symptoms besides the GYN symptoms like irregular cycles or breakthrough bleeding, heavier, more painful periods or PMS symptoms, we get the anxiety, the forgetfulness, the mood swings, the nervousness, the, maybe the palpitations, but those are symptoms. Those are, you know, those are symptoms that your brain is starving for fuel. Those are neurologic symptoms. So we call that a period of neuroendocrine vulnerability. But when you shift into ketosis, ketones, the use of ketones for fuel in the brain are not hormone dependent. So all of a sudden the mood swings go away. The brain fog lifts. You've got more energy, more clarity. That's because your brain's no longer starving for fuel. You've bypassed that hormone dependent process. And that's powerful. So I think that's, you know, it's interesting on the evolutionary standpoint, if we were made post menopause to be able to fast longer, 
to have more wisdom, clarity, spiritual connection than being in ketosis when we're fasting. We're in a very high state of ketosis that gets us there from an energetic, you know, vibration, vibrational level. This is so good. It's, it's good, so good, right? Yeah. It's fascinating. The body's fascinating. And we have, again, this is something that we have access to in menu pause. You walk people yeah. through various diet frameworks mm -hmm. and, and it's really basing it on you as an individual, right? Because that's the thing too. What's gonna work for you right now might change and to have the guidance of someone like yourself to walk people through and get people educated on how to utilize different fuels and help to really just kind of feel in your body again and in control of your body. So Menu Pause is available, The Hormone Fix, amazing books, bestsellers, everybody should have them. If you, Thank you are a woman or you know a woman if you love a woman make sure that you get a copy of these books are such a great thing because it's directing you back to yourself and putting the power in your hands now going back to one of the things you said at the very beginning of the episode you mentioned the environment that we're in right now and the advent of these obesogens that we're exposed to in our environment now it sounds like obesity is in the name yeah. of that thing so are obesogens potentially gumming up or disrupting the function of our important hormones like oxytocin? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And also, you mentioned something about truffle hunters. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about food as medicine. So first, the concept of obesogen. So what that is, that is affecting our endocrine system. That's affecting the receptor site. And whether it's damaging the receptor sites in um, decreasing the ability of our body's natural hormonal production or creating inflammation, mm. those in those three ways, obes obesogens can make us fat, make us metabolically sluggish, make us our mitochondrial function decline. I mean, these are, I mean, so that's the concept involved with obesogens and inflammation is tied right in there. So everything we can do to reduce inflammation, I actually was thinking about, because we were just down the street from you here at a great ca cafe and it, um, we had a, I had a turmeric milk latte. It was so good. And the first thing I do is take off the plastic lid. And, and I look over at my daughters and they're drinking through the plastic. I'm like, haven't I taught you better <laughs> taking off the plastic lid? But the chemicals from that plastic lid are, you know, endocrine disruptors for sure. And so that's one way. And then I was like talking about my truffle hunters and food as medicine. So, you know, one of the best foods to increase oxytocin. What is it? Truffles. Is that why they're probably so expensive? Maybe, but you know, this is what I, I didn't even know this association until I was Italy for my Italy for my birthday last summer. Part of the group that we were in, we were part of this Maverick group and um, we went on a truffle hunt and the two guys that were hunting, and it was with dogs, not pigs. And what the dogs do, the, guy, the truffle hunters go out with these dogs and they go into the woods and they sniff out the truffle and they bring it to the truffle hunter and the truffle hunter is this super happy guy, like mm. smiling ear to ear, just loving life. And so I'm asking him questions. I'm like, okay, so did you've always wanted to do this? Cause I love being out in nature. And I'm like, well, maybe that's why he's so happy. And then he, you know, cutting up the truffle and eating the truffle. I'm like, huh, does truffles increase oxytocin? I wonder. So I did the research, actually truffles increase anandamides. Mm, so bliss chemicals. Bliss chemicals. So closely tied in and um, anandamides enhance oxytocin receptor sensitivity. Holy guacamole. Holy guacamole. Wow. So let's go have some truffles. I love it. Yes. I love it. Truffles and chocolate, and chocolate as well. It does the same thing. I love talking with you. This is so awesome. This um, has been great. Thank can you. Can you let people know where they can get more into your universe? I know you have a maca product as well yeah. and you mentioned it a little bit earlier can you let people know what that is and just where to follow you and all the good stuff yes thank you thank you for that i'm easy to find i'm at dranna.com so that's my website is dranna.com and i'm at the girlfriend doctor on all the social media channels and i have the girlfriend doctor podcast which you'll be listening to sean on in the near future and so i um I, I just love helping my clients. I have my Mighty Maca Plus adaptogenic blend product that's now in capsules for Energize and for menopause support, two different versions. And um, I'm here to help. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. 
to up-level your health today. Men and menopausal women probably have the easiest transition to fasting because their hormones, there's not as much fluctuation. If you're already lean and you're still at peak fertility years, so 35 and under, you have to be careful about when you're fasting.